We've had good speakers today. Uh, one more talk that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. Thanks for coming out um, and thanks for participating. If you have questions for our speaker in the last presentation, um, be sure to type them in the chat and then we'll um, curate them at the end in the Q&A session. The um, Astro Imaging contest voting is just about to end in less than a minute. So um, the results of that will get announced um, at the end of this talk. Um, I will mention again that we have a speaker coming on uh, April 1st to talk about Venus. Um, visit the Klein Observatory website for more information on that as it develops. We also have, um, uh, that's Paul Byrne on um, April 1st, and then in September for our Fall Astronomy Day lecture, the Joe Klein Memorial Lecture, um, Emily Levesque will be our speaker. So um, revisit our website um, in the future for more information about those talks. We are open on Friday nights for public viewing now, every Friday if the skies are clear. Um, we had shut down again for a little while with the Omicron surge, but we're back in business now. And um, <clears throat> basically, um, from March through October, we start as darkness falls uh, for those sessions. And of course, they're weather permitting. So um, if you check our website, check the observatory's um, Twitter account um, at GTCC Astro, you'll see information about um, whether we're open or not on Fridays. Um, so we're ready for our final speaker and I see she's here so we'll get her ready to go in just a second but let me um, tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Britt Lundgren is an associate professor of physics and astronomy at University of uh, North Carolina at Asheville. She specializes in observational studies of galaxy evolution. She's going to share her research with us today. After completing her PhD at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, she held postdoctoral research appointments at Yale University and the University of Wisconsin-Madison and worked as a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the National Science Foundation. Since 2016, she served as co-chair of the Education and Public Outreach for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey 4 collaboration. And in 2020, she was named a Cottrell Scholar by the Research Corporation for Science Advancement. So I'm going to turn things over now to Dr. Britt Lundgren to tell us about galaxies in silhouette. Thank you, Tom. Um, thank you all for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, let me just make sure that I can show my slides. Is it OK if I share my screen? All right. Okay, great. Um, so while I'm presenting, I can't see um, even Tom. So, so please, uh, Tom, feel free to interrupt me if there's an urgent question that I can answer or, or um, if for any reason something goes wrong. Um, but can you just verify that you can see everything okay before I go? Um, I see your slides. Um, you're not in present mode yet, but I see your screen. Uh, not in present mode. I see um, all the slides down the side. Oh, that's a shame. I'm not sure if I know how to fix that. Hang on one second. How about that? Is that a little bit better? That's a little bit better. I still <laughs> see some info on the right. Um, yeah, so if you try and stop sharing and then um, share again, because if you're not in the presentation mode when you share, oh, um, okay. sometimes okay. it'll just share whatever. Um, Thank you. Um, after using rather than the actual presentation. Right. Okay. Thanks. Let me try. Let me try that then. Um, I'm not sure if I can do that. Sorry. Either share the whole screen or you can share the oh, visual application or window. That's a great idea. I'll try that. Sorry for the trouble here. Um. 
Um, sorry, you'd think two years into this virtual environment, I would know how to do this, but this is my first time with Microsoft Teams. I apologize. Um, well, will, will this work? <laughs> um, I mean, you sure? or have, do you have any any animations that needed to be in presentation mode? Um, I do, but I think I can um, I can control them this okay. way. OK, um, so just in the interest of time, I may go forward. Um, and. Um, Okay. Well, my apologies. Um, let's see if I can hide any of the rest. Uh, can you see my mouse? Yes. Good. Okay. That's actually helpful for pointing. So um, if, if this is okay, I might just go ahead with um, the way it's currently shown. Is that all right? Go for it. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so, so thank you again for the invitation. What I'm going to be talking about today is um, my primary work, which um, you know involves a study of the gas that surrounds galaxies, and the way that that kind of study is possible um, is through essentially silhouetting the galaxies using brighter background light sources. Um, and the particular kind of source that I use for this work is a quasar, and I'll talk about why that is um, in a few minutes, but I just want to show you a brief title slide with some uh, kind of cartoon to give you a feel for exactly what it is um, that I'm, I'm doing. Uh, so uh, as, as Tom mentioned, my um, uh, primary field of study is galaxy evolution. And so I'm interested in studying how galaxies form at early times and how they evolve in terms of their size and color and shape over time. Um, so thanks to amazing instruments like the Hubble Space Telescope and, and James Webb, which we're all really excited about, um, which will be getting first light and taking some observations in the coming weeks and months, um, we have deep images of the distant universe, which allow us to see what galaxies look like at great distances um, uh, away from us. So you're all probably familiar with this. This is one of the most famous images um, ever made. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Uh, the version of this image that I'm showing you has over um, two weeks of exposure time taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, which of course lives in, or in orbit around the Earth, so it's above the Earth's atmosphere and able to take these nice sharp images of the distant universe. So the, the field of view for the Hubble Space Telescope is about one-tenth of the diameter of the full moon. So that's what you're seeing, just shown for scale, um, inset on the left-hand side. And within this single field of view, um, you can see that almost every dot of light is a galaxy, with the exception of about three or four things that you might be able to see in this image, which are individual stars in our own Milky Way. So this is an extremely powerful image, which allows us to essentially count up how many galaxies we can see in just this one little area of the sky, and then extrapolate to how many galaxies must be in our observable universe. So that's one of the most important things you can get just from this one image alone, which contains about 10,000 individually resolvable galaxies. Um, some of those galaxies in the, in the distance um, in this image, which are very, very tiny and very, very red, uh, we're seeing as they emitted light uh, almost 13 billion years ago. Um, so the things that are biggest and brightest in this image are generally the galaxies that are closest to us. And as you peer deeper into the image towards smaller things, you're seeing things that are uh, on average more distant and therefore being seen earlier in cosmic history. So just using one deep image like this, we can actually build up a study of what galaxies look like over time. So how their colors, their shapes, um, and their 
star formation rates change over billions of years. Of course, we can't follow one galaxy over the course of its lifetime, but in an image like this, we can see what galaxies on average look like billions and billions of years ago and compare that to what they look like in our modern universe. So a very, very powerful tool. So thanks to deep um, extragalactic surveys done with the Hubble Space Telescope and other um, multi-wavelength observatories, we've been able to, over the past few decades, build up an understanding of how galaxies change over those 13 billion years that we can observe them. And so what I'm showing you here is a pretty famous plot, um, which collects a lot of those measurements and observations from these deep galaxy surveys um, and puts them together in terms of the average star formation rate of galaxies as a function of time. So I'm showing two scales on the x-axis. So one is look back time, starting it today on the left-hand side and going all the way back to about 13 billion years ago. On the bottom axis, also on the x-axis, is redshift which I'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes, but that's another way that astronomers tend to talk about uh, simultaneously the distance of uh, distant objects and also how long it's taken their light to reach us, um, which we refer to as, as look back time. Uh, so many of you are probably already well aware of that, but I don't want to assume. Uh, so if you look at the galaxies in these deep surveys and measure um, uh, how fast they're forming stars just through an analysis of their spectra, um, you would see that there's an overarching trend throughout cosmic history, where at early times, about 13 billion years ago until about 10 billion years ago, the star formation rates of galaxies were really ramping up on average. So every year they were forming more and more stars. Now, something seems to have happened about nine or 10 billion years ago that has turned that trend around. And galaxies in the modern universe are declining in their rates of star formation more and more um, uh, each year. So we're currently in a rate of decline in terms of the average number of new stars produced in the universe uh, in a volume average sample. So, so put simply, stars are forming more slowly than they used to in the past. Um, so this gives rise to a few um, uh, little nicknames for these periods of cosmic history. So some people refer to uh, the, the, the early period as cosmic dawn, when galaxies are really ramping up their ability to form new stars. Um, you might hear this period in the middle where star formation is really going like crazy, but hasn't really started on the decline yet. Um, oftentimes that's referred to as cosmic noon. There are some dissenters to that for good reason, but it, it has picked up some steam. And where we find ourselves today could be cosmic dusk, um, or you could put a more positive spin on it and think of it as cosmic happy hour, right? So we are in um, the, the dusk of cosmic history as, it, um, as measured by the formation of stars, um, but it doesn't necessarily uh, mean a bad thing. Okay, so what could it be that's causing galaxies to stop forming stars? Well, you have to think about what galaxies need to form stars in the first place. So essentially what they need is a reservoir of cold gas um, gas is the primary uh, ingredient to stars. Most of the gas in the universe is in the form of hydrogen. About 25% 20 of it is in the form of helium with a little sprinkling of heavier elements. So clouds of gas, if they're sufficiently cold, um, will collapse under their own gravity, um, overwhelming the pressure support that might stop that collapse and ultimately form into new stars. So in young active galaxies, this is happening regularly. Our own Milky Way um, it forms about one new star per year, which is a, a pretty modest rate of star formation at this, part, at this point in time. Uh, but many galaxies that we see around us in the modern universe have really slowed down their star formation rates, especially those that are really massive or live in really dense parts of the universe. And so it's of interest to people who study galaxy evolution to think about why it is that star formation is shutting down 
in galaxies um, as a function of certain properties, like their size, environment, etc. cetera. Um, so anything that's actually starving the galaxies from the availability of cold gas could achieve that. Um, so you could mechanically remove cold gas from galaxies, that's one way to do it, or you could just heat up the gas that's already there through supernova um, explosions, through feedback from supermassive black holes, which can be very energetic when they're in the process of accreting new material. Um, anything that's adding heat and energy to the gas um, could effectively shut down its star formation. So uh, while we think we understand what can achieve this, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. And so um, asking these questions and trying to probe them is a, a major ongoing um, uh, kind of uh, uh, question, a, ma a major goal of modern galaxy evolution studies. So our own Milky Way, as many of you may um, be able to see it sometimes, looks something like this in a nice, beautiful, um, dark night. Um, and you can tell by the shape of the Milky Way that, of course, it is a, a spiral um, disk galaxy, which we happen to live within. Um, a cartoon version, if you could see it from a bird's eye view of our Milky Way galaxy, might look something like this. We know it's a barred spiral galaxy. We're about two thirds of the way out from the center, um, kind of in the suburbs on one of those extended spiral arms. So this is what most people have in mind when they think about our own home galaxy in the grand scheme of things. Um, but this is more what I think about when I think about our Milky Way. So of course, um, there's a disk with uh, 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 lots and lots of stars and the gas and dust makes up those lanes of um, spiral arms, which are um, characteristic features of the spiral galaxy we call home. But not everyone appreciates that actually there's an enormous halo of gas that surrounds our Milky Way, about 10 times bigger than the visible part of our galaxy if you were to see it from afar. So extending out to about 500,000 light years is this massive halo of gas. Um, and while it's diffuse um, and difficult to observe, we have over the past few decades been able to quantify how much gas there really is surrounding us in this, um, in this halo. And our current estimates point to there being approximately the same amount of mass in that gas as there is locked up in stars in our own, um, in the disk of the galaxy. So even though we can't see it very easily, there's an enormous reservoir of mass, mostly in the form of hydrogen and helium that surrounds the Milky Way. Um, and that halo is actually a really dynamic place. So you might be tempted to think of it as just this kind of static cloud, but really there's a lot of active processes going on in that halo surrounding us. Um, so you have, clouds that are um, uh, being accreted onto the Milky Way, either coming from intergalactic space or from the halo itself, falling onto the disk, potentially feeding new fresh star formation. Uh, you also have um, gas that's being blown out of the disk as a result of supernova explosions and possibly even feedback from the supermassive black hole at the center. Um, depending on how fast that gas gets accelerated away from the disk, um, and depending on the mass of the galaxy pulling back on it, it may fully escape, but more often in our own galaxy, today, that gas gets recycled. So it gets blown up, but then because of gravity, turns back around and produces this kind of fountain behavior of gas recycling, which leads to um, a, a fresh generation of stars with slightly more enrichment in that gas. Um, so if you look at the sky, not in optical wavelengths, but in the radio, you might um, be able to see something like this. Streamers of gas in ne neutral hydrogen, for example, um, which are densest around the large and small Magellanic clouds, those dwarf galaxies, which are in the process of being acquired um, onto the Milky Way. 
Uh, and so, uh, so radio emission is one way that we've been able to quantify how much gas is out there in the halo, but also to see some of those dynamic processes playing out. So in this case, what you're seeing is a streamer produced by um, stripping of the gas out of those dwarf galaxies as they interact with the halo of the Milky Way. So in a kind of cartoon um, model, this is what we refer to as the baryon cycle. All of these uh, dynamic processes which, um, which have to do with how gas moves in and around onto and out of galaxies. So you have accretion, recycling, and outflows, which again, depending on um, their velocity and the gravity of the galaxy, they're um, trying to escape. Those may fully uh, make it out into intergalactic space um, or they may be drawn back. So uh, this baryon cycle is something that is uh, a, a primary study of mine and something uh, that we're getting more and better data to understand every year. Fortunately, now we also have really detailed um, simulations coming from theorists who work on building computer models of how uh, gas forms galaxies over time and how processes of gas accretion and outflows can um, change the course of history for galaxies. So I'm gonna show you one really nice um, movie from one of the more uh, sophisticated models that we have to compare our observations to today. This is called the fire simulation. And the visualization of this um, simulated uh, cube of the universe was made by Cameron Hummels, an astronomer at Caltech. Um, so what I'm about to show you is what simulations predict um, the formation of a galaxy like our own Milky Way should look like if we were able to see what's going on with the gas. So in the simulation, the brighter the pixels, the denser the gas in that part of the simulation. And so you can follow the growth of this one particular Milky Way-like galaxy over time. So here in the center, um, you can see a growing ring, which is meant to show the, air, the volume surrounding this growing galaxy, which would include everything that becomes gravitationally bound, what's referred to as the burial radius of the galaxy. So you can see there's a lot of dynamic processes, smaller satellites that are merging with this growing um, uh, and now kind of disky looking early spiral galaxy and it ends at our current point in time about 13 billion years after the big bang and what you should see here is a nice dense disk surrounded um, by uh, more diffuse gas okay so that's what the simulation looks like if you have an eye on the density of the gas but it also looks um, uh, it's interesting also to ask what happens Oh, sorry, seem to be missing. Ah, okay. If you trace not the density, but the temperature. So in this same uh, simulation, now we're going to color code uh, the pixels such that the bright things are showing high temperatures, not high densities. And so if we watch this play forward in time, you might see something very much more dynamic. So here you can see as that gas is accreting onto that forming galaxy, it produces many, many generations of explosions. So each of these are star formation events um, where the formation of massive stars over a very short period of time leads to the um, cataclysmic death of those stars in supernova explosions. And so what, what may look like a very quiet process of accreting gas, if you can see what's going on with the temperature of gas, uh, would reveal that this is actually a very, um, a, a, a very active, dynamic, um, and kind of explosive process. Okay, so thanks to um, the fire simulation, eagle simulation, and uh, ones like this, the illustrious TNG simulation, we now have really detailed expectations about where gas should be around galaxies and how its properties should change as the galaxy evolves with time. So this is just a snapshot of um, a similar simulation 
uh, from the illustrious collaboration. And here you can see maybe, hopefully, little arrows showing the direction that gas is expected to be moving um, into and out of a spiral disk galaxy at about redshift one, which is approximately um, uh, 8 billion uh, uh, years ago in terms of look back time. So about halfway back in time. Okay, so ideally what we'd like to do is take these simulations as a guide to try to test them, see which ones are correctly predicting what the real universe looks like. And in order to do this, we need to be able to explore where the gas is around galaxies and how it's evolving with the, the stars that we can more easily see. So this gas is difficult to detect um, because it's not very luminous. It's not bright like stars. Um, and so detecting normal matter, not dark matter, but just normal matter made out of um, hydrogen, helium, and some metals uh, can be a challenge because it is essentially so dark. Um, but I think intuitively, you've done this before, um, backlighting is a way that we commonly are able to see things that are not emitting light in our own lives at night. So this is not um, a very uh, seasonally appropriate example. So maybe um, we can think of, we're approaching the Easter holiday now, so maybe a rabbit silhouette is more helpful. But this is essentially um, the best way that we know how to detect gas around these distant galaxies and try to um, observe it and study it. And so of course, it's not quite so easy as completely obscuring a, a bright full moon. Uh, but uh, when we look through um, clouds of gas in space towards a background light source that produces continuous light, um, anything that produces a continuous spectrum like a star or a quasar will do the trick. Uh, if that light passes through a cloud of gas, select wavelengths will be absorbed. And if you look at the absorption spectrum, you should be able to see where at specific wavelengths of light, um, the, the flux is lower than you would expect if that continuous light source were unobscured. So from that pattern of light alone, we can tell what the gas is made out of. This is a, a, a brilliant, um, uh, lucky uh, uh, kind of way that the universe helps us out as astronomers because of course we can't go out to those clouds and take a sample. Um, but thanks to spectroscopy and quantum mechanics, um, we can tell exactly what that cloud is made out of just based on the pattern of absorption lines in the spectrum. So this has been known for some time. Um, uh, most famously, perhaps about a hundred years ago, Edwin Hubble um, was investigating the shifts in absorption lines that were seen in galaxies, um, both near and far. Uh, what I'm showing you here are some of Hubble's original galaxy spectra and images of the galaxies themselves that produce those spectra. Uh, and what you can see is that there are two dark lines, those calcium H and K lines in each of these galaxy spectra that show up at a different um, wavelength if, if you could see this in color, it would span blue to red. Um, so they're shifting towards the red as you go to galaxies which are actually more distant. Um, so the shifting of that light was well understood um, to be caused by essentially the Doppler effect. If you have a moving light, um, light source, then the, the um, light it's emitting will be redshifted depending on its velocity. So the greater the velocity um, of recession for a galaxy with respect to um, our observations, the greater the redshifting of those H and K calcium lines that you would expect. Um, Hubble, of course, is famous for uh, 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 kind of linking this to um, evidence that the universe itself must be expanding. But um, since we're in North Carolina, I like to also mention that he was an amazing basketball player and was a three-time collegiate champion back when the University of Chicago was a powerhouse, unlike um, uh, it is today. So anyway, little fun fact, which not everyone knows. Um, and of course, um, he and his observing partner, Milton uh, Hummison, 
were the first to show really good evidence that if you plot the distance of galaxies versus the redshifting of their features or the velocity you infer from that redshifting, you would see a trend. And the way to explain the fact that more distant galaxies seem to be receding more quickly away from us in every direction that we look can really best be explained by space itself uh, expanding. And so this is a, a major pillar of our modern cosmology um, and was a huge revelation at the time. I also like to point out, maybe many of you know this, but Milton Humason um, was not formally trained as an astronomer. He didn't even graduate from high school, uh, but he was into mountaineering and found himself on Mount Wilson as, um, as the observatory was becoming um, uh, really busy. He was hired to work there as a night assistant and um, Hubble recognized that he was just a fantastic natural observer. And so um, he and Hubble worked closely together for a long time and made, um, a great, uh, uh, made a great partnership. So he deserves equal credit for that discovery. Okay, so thanks to this understanding of redshift, we now have an even greater tool at our disposal, right? We've already shown that if you can identify a pattern of absorption lines in a, an absorption line spectrum, you can tell what the cloud in between you and that star um, is actually made out of. But then if you also notice that that pattern of lines is shifted, every line that you expect in that pattern sh being shifted by the same scale, um, you can determine the redshift of that cloud as well. And that gives you a measurement, thanks to Hubble's law, of its distance. So this gives us an extra tool. Not only do we know what the clouds are made out of, but we know how far away they are as well. And so with one single spectrum, you can actually identify multiple clouds, figure out what each of those clouds are made out of and how far along the line of sight um, they're found. So essentially, we can now make core samples of the universe, uh, picking up gas and dust along the way and determining um, its composition and its distance from us. So really, really powerful tool. Now, of course, if you're observing clouds of gas in our own galaxy, you could use stars as your backlights. Those would work fine. But if we're really interested in understanding how galaxies change over billions of years, we need something even brighter that's able to shine from behind one of those distant galaxies and provide us um, with enough light to measure the absorption spectrum. So again, the universe has been pretty kind because there are such things, these distant quasars, which um, look uh, like normal stars in the sky, but if you examine their spectrum, uh, they have really distinct features that make it very obvious that they're not um, as simple as they look. So distant quasars, unlike stars, um, have these sharp um, and broad emission lines, which indicate uh, due to the width of their lines that it's actually light being produced by a rapidly rotating accretion disk around a supermassive black hole. So these quasars had been discovered in the 60s. It took a while to determine that they really were very, very distant galaxies. It was confusing how they could be so bright and so far away. Uh, but being powered by a supermassive black hole is um, the really only explanation for how that could be possible. And now, um, uh, now our understanding of quasars has um, is, is uh, pretty sophisticated. So these really are distant galaxies and we're really just seeing light from the innermost region around the supermassive black hole, which when activated, when accreting matter onto the black hole becomes very, very bright. And when that happens, that central region about the size of a solar system around that supermassive black hole will become so bright it outshines all of the stars in the galaxy by a factor of maybe 100. So these are some of the brightest objects in the universe, ironically um, being powered by some of the, the darkest objects in the universe as well. So these quasars, because of their extreme luminosities, shine behind the distant galaxies that we're interested in. And a single quasar spectrum might probe multiple galaxies along the way, which is really, really useful. Um, 
um, in terms of building up samples, being able to uh, see what's going on in the halos of multiple galaxies um, at different look back times and, and different um, ages in the universe. Um, and so I'm going to show you what a quasar spectrum looks like in a really nice visualization made by Andrew Ponson. I think he was at Cambridge when he made this, and it's really, really helpful for understanding how this absorption line spectroscopy works. Um, what we're going to do is take a little ride on a photon that is departing from a quasar. And so imagine you're riding on this photon, this packet of light, and you're looking backwards as you go. So you're looking back towards the quasar. And a, ignore the relativistic complications of, of doing this, but imagine that you're able to take a spectrum of the quasar looking back at it as you move away from it. Okay, and every time you pass through a cloud, an imprint of that cloud in absorption will appear on the spectrum. Okay, and, and as you move away from that quasar, it will look like it's receding away from you, and so it, the, the features of the spectrum will be redshifting as you go. So this is what the quasar spectrum looks like, just raw. If you were right up next to it and seeing only its emission, those broad lines, again, being produced by the accretion disk around that supermassive black hole. And now we're gonna hitch a ride and move away from that quasar. And as we look back, every time we pass through a cloud, a new set of absorption lines for hydrogen mostly um, add on to the spectrum. And then if you pass through um, something really dense, like a galaxy that also has more enrichment of heavier elements from previous generations of star formation, that will produce other patterns of absorption, which you see out here, um, which you can identify as things like magnesium, iron, carbon, etc. So this is how one single quasar spectrum can show you, you know, a nice core sample of everything that light passes through along the way. Okay, so analyzing those spectra of distant quasars, we can get a ton of physical information. So we can tell for sure that there's something at a particular location probing a galaxy. We can also tell what the composition of that gas is. And based on uh, the spectral uh, uh, characteristics, we can also measure the temperature and density and kinematics of that gas as well. So these are really, really powerful probes of the physical conditions of gas around galaxies that can give us insight into how this cycle of accretion and outflows um, helps galaxies evolve over time. Okay, so the advantage to these quasars is that they're very, very bright, which means we can see them from the very distant universe and study all the galaxies in between. Now, the disadvantage is that they're kind of rare. So we think most galaxies probably go through a quasar phase, uh, but it's not a, a, maybe a very long lasting um, period. And of course, it, it, these quasars can, we think, turn on and off as well. Um, but uh, this is all to say that they're a little bit rare. Um, when I was in college, I'm not going to say how long ago, uh, but there were only a couple thousand quasars known. Um, thanks to large extragalactic surveys that have happened over the past couple of decades, we now have hundreds of thousands of known quasars, but that's still dramatically smaller than the numbers of known normal galaxies. So they're relatively sparse on the sky. Um, which means that a single galaxy that we're interested in studying will be very unlikely to have more than one quasar behind it. So we really only get one little skewer through um, any given galaxy, and, and that's if we're lucky to have that one. So they're pretty sparse, and what that means is that if you want to use quasars to study the gas around galaxies, you need to do it statistically, building up really large samples of quasars behind galaxies and studying on average what, what, where does that uh, gas that we detect in the quasar spectra, where is it found around those uh, foreground galaxies. And so fortunately, we do have really large samples of both quasars and galaxies. 
um, thanks to many surveys, but the, the kind of first big um, survey of this type was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which started in 1999 and has been running um, ever since in, in different generations. Um, the first goal of the survey was to make the biggest color digital image of the sky, covering about one third of the night sky, which you can observe um, from the, the camera's location in Apache Point, New Mexico. Um, the telescope itself is not particularly large. It's a 2.4 uh, meter telescope, um, but the, the goal of the survey was um, to have a very, very large map. So it's not as detailed as what you would get with the Hubble Space Telescope, for instance, or a much bigger telescope like Keck, but because of its size, it's able to, and, and focal length, it's able to make a, a large survey very quickly. Um, the other key aspect of the Sloan's uh, uh, strategy for making maps of the universe was to quickly build up spectra of galaxies and quasars using a multi-object spectrograph that in its current generation can take a thousand spectra all at once and uh, take many different cartridges of um, those thousand spectra plates um, in a single evening. So thanks to that survey design, uh, the, the Sloan has been able to make the biggest three-dimensional map of where galaxies and quasars and stars are located in our, um, in our surrounding universe. So um, of those objects that have been compiled with the Sloan are now about 400,000 quasars. Um, this means we have 400,000 skewers of the distant universe from which to measure the gas around galaxies in between. Now, a big challenge of having that much data is that you actually have to automate um, the process of analyzing it. And so I've been involved uh, with an effort to do that for a very long time. Um, and we now have a very large sample of individual intervening clouds linked to galaxies that could, no, could, could not in any other way be detected. So hundreds of thousands of these have now been detected. Here you could see just one example of a pattern of absorption lines coming from one cloud around a single galaxy. This has the kind of heavy elements that stars produce in supernovae, so magnesium and iron, and an automated algorithm looks for that pattern of absorption, detects it, and figures out the redshift. Right? So we know in three dimensions where these clouds are located for um, uh, hundreds of thousands of them. Now, sometimes the algorithm gets it wrong. Um, a little bit of noise can throw off the machine. Um, a little bit of strangeness in the quasar spectrum can do it as well. Uh, and so we're also asking for help. If you're interested in looking at some of these and spot checking, a, a subsample of them, we would love to get some help. So we've made a, a Galaxy Zoo project called Invisible Galaxy Zoo. This has been um, a, a project uh, made entirely by my students at UNC Asheville. Um, the current version is led by Austin Shank, who recently graduated and is now a software engineer. Um, but it's a really simple interface that even kids could um, learn to use, and it would do us a huge favor if you were interested in taking a look at um, some of those spectra and giving us your opinion. Um, so if you want to find it, there's a tiny URL up here, which maybe I can put in the chat later on as well. Um, and the, the right hand side is Invisible Galaxy Zoo. So thanks in advance if you have time to take a look at that. Um, so what you're going to notice if you do look at some of those Sloan quasar spectra is that uh, we're asking specifically for you to look at detections of magnesium absorption. So magnesium-2 specifically, so that's uh, astronomy speak for singly ionized absorption by magnesium. So a magnesium atom that has been struck with ultraviolet light that has caused it to lose one of its electrons. Um, and the temperature of gas where that is uh, possible is around 10,000 degrees Kelvin. After a lot of, um, you know, uh, decades of study of this particular absorption doublet, um, it's been noticed that these, this kind of gas is associated with galaxies. It's not a big surprise because you need stars to make magnesium out of the, the pure intergalactic gas. 
Um, and we also uh, have good reason to believe that this magnesium, which is easy to see because of the shape of its pattern of lines, um, should also be tracing all those interesting processes and galaxies that we think are determining how a galaxy evolves. So we think that there's magnesium tracing inflowing gas that feeds galaxies and helps them form new stars and also traces outflows, um, which may also ultimately shut down the star formation in those galaxies. So uh, there's a, a so we study it because it's easy to find, first of all, but it also fortunately traces all of these processes that are so interesting. Now, the only problem is that while our algorithms are able to comb through hundreds of thousands of quasar spectra and detect hundreds of thousands of these tracers of foreground galaxies, um, uh, it's actually hard to see the galaxies themselves because in this shallow imaging produced by the Sloan Digital Sky Surveys Telescope in New Mexico, we can usually only see the quasar. And even then in this ground-based imaging, it doesn't look particularly sharp, right? So we're able to use the light from the quasar to detect the gas in, it, in the spectrum of the quasar, but we don't actually know what that gas is doing, how far away it is from the galaxy it was produced by, or where it is relative to the disk of the galaxy, for instance. All of that is really, really hard to know with um, the data that we have. But if you have um, Hubble Space Telescope time to look at that particular quasar that you're interested in, you would see that it's easy to pick up many more distant faint galaxies at that resolution and sensitivity and above the Earth's atmosphere. So this is really the Hubble Space Telescope's image of that same quasar that I just showed you um, in the SDSS. And if we just zoom in on it, you can see that there are four galaxies that are actually close enough to that quasar in the center that any one of those could be the host galaxy of the absorption that we detect in the quasar spectrum. So we don't actually know which galaxy that cloud belongs to. And this is a, a really hard problem for making progress in this particular field of study. So we want to know the redshifts for each of those galaxies. Once you know the redshift, you know how far away it is, and then you can actually say, is it at the same redshift as the gas? If so, those two are likely to be related. And so this is our goal. Um, fortunately, the latest servicing mission in 2009 of the Hubble Space Telescope um, uh, delivered an amazing infrared camera called the uh, Wide Field Camera 3 which also contains a grism setting which um, disperses the light in the infrared and produces kind of low resolution um, uh, spectra for every bright object in the field. So what you're seeing here is the direct image coming uh, in the infrared into the wide field camera three. This is what if you change your setting to the grism that same field would look like with every bright object having its light dispersed into a low resolution spectrum. We can then model those spectra and look for emission lines, which allow us to determine the redshifts and therefore the distances of each of those galaxies. Those emission lines also can tell us how rapidly those stars are, or those galaxies are forming stars, which is also really, really useful and important. Um, so I was a part of a survey team that made a pretty big survey using this method in um, the early 2010s. Uh, and uh, we built up a sample of about 10,000 galaxy redshifts using this um, method. And it occurred to me at the time that this would also be a really great possible solution to the, um, the study of gas around galaxies. And so with a number of collaborators, um, some of which were on that original Hubble Space Telescope team, um, some others who are experts in gas. We put in a Hubble Space Telescope proposal to use that same method to look at quasars in the SDSS and try to build up a bigger sample of uh, galaxies that matched to the gas we'd already detected. So we picked nine quasars out of the entire sample of hundreds of thousands, and we picked them because they had the most stuff along the line of sight. 
that made them really high value targets because we think with one observation, we would be able to collect a number of pairs of galaxies matched to the gas. So here's just one of those quasars. Every color coded set of different um, uh, elements here is showing you an absorption line belonging to a cloud at a specific redshift. So this one quasar had five different um, absorption clouds along the line of sight, each of which we think we would be able to match to a galaxy. So this is what our data looked like. We got the time. Um, this is one of our nine fields. The, the bright thing in the center is the quasar. And this is the direct image. We took two orientations with the infrared camera. And this is one of those GRISM uh, images, sorry, GRISM uh, observations. And we actually took two of those because as you might have already been suspecting, it's easy for, um, depending on your, your angle of orientation, for some objects to run into the spectra from other objects. So we covered our bases having multiple orientations so that if one bright star, for instance, spilled over the um, dispersed light from a fainter galaxy that we were interested in, we'd have at least a second chance of trying to uh, detect that galaxy. So this worked really well. All but um, one of the fields gave us really good data. And what's shown here are just a bunch of different galaxies detected in one of those fields. Every one that has a circle around it is one that we matched to uh, clouds of gas that we detected in the quasar spectrum. And the quasar is in the very center here. So shown on the right are what the spectra look like for each of those galaxies. It's kind of messy data, but in most cases we had at least one emission line um, that allowed us to determine definitively how far away those galaxies were and also how rapidly they're forming stars. So I'm just, I only have a few more slides. I want to show you just quickly some of the results that have come from this Hubble Space Telescope program, um, led really by some fantastic students that have recently graduated from UNC Asheville. So Matthew Peake, um, who was a computer science student, graduated in 2019. Um, he looked at uh, whether or not the star formation rates of galaxies in these fields was correlated with the presence of magnesium to gas around them. And what he was able to show is that there's actually a pretty strong correlation here that magnesium too tends to be probing galaxies that are actively forming stars and also uh, forming stars in really concentrated regions in those galaxies. Um, and uh, and this, is, this is really important for trying to understand what it is that we're seeing when we pick up those um, magnesium-2 enriched clouds. So, so there's some connection to star formation, uh, which is really provocative. Um, a, a little bit later, um, Samantha Creech, who's now a PhD student at University of Utah, um, uh, made a really beautiful analysis measuring the shapes of the galaxies in the images and how they're, um, uh, how they're positioned relative to that background quasar. She was able to study statistically where the gas is around these galaxies as a function of um, angle from the disk. So this is called the azimuthal angle, and what she's able to show in this histogram of where those detections showed up is that we see a little bump at zero angle, presumably gas that's um, uh, kind of associated with the disk of the galaxy. And then there's an over density at about 60 degrees, which agrees with predictions that if these galaxies are blowing out gas, the um, the winds from uh, uh, the galaxies should be um, largely perpendicular to the disk of the galaxy following the axis of rotation, but also spread out at some angle. And they should also be denser around the edges and cleared out a little bit on the inside. And that explains uh, perhaps why we tend to see excess gas around this particular angle um, uh, around the rotation axes of galaxies. So she's essentially been able to show statistically that that magnesium too is also probing winds. So star forming galaxies that are also driving winds, which is uh, really helpful in terms of comparing to simulations. She was also able to show that those winds peter out at some point beyond 80 kiloparsecs, you just don't see that pattern anymore. 
And that's really, really interesting as well, because that's precisely what had been predicted by the illustrious TNG simulations. Um, and we just couldn't believe, actually, that we had good enough data to see that and, and to agree so closely with those simulations, but we did. And so this is what those simulations look like. Here you can see um, in each case what the simulations predict in terms of the extent of winds going from the disk of the galaxy, which is on the left-hand side of the plot, out uh, uh, 100 kiloparsecs or more um, to the point where that kind of peters out. And the simulations predict that the strength of those winds and how far they extend away from galaxies should depend on how massive those galaxies are as well. Um, we're not able to constrain that and, and test it, but we're hoping that we will in the future. So we're currently um, submitting a, a proposal to get more imaging data from, uh, from Hubble, essentially making these black and white images from our initial survey into color versions that allow us to better study the galaxies that we've linked to those clouds of gas. So that'll be able, uh, that will help us measure the, the star formation rates a little bit better and also um, estimate how massive those galaxies are. So wish us luck for that. Um, and then in future directions, I think you'll only see more science coming out of this particular um, corner of galaxy evolution. The DESI project right now is obtaining millions of new quasar and galaxy spectra. Um, they're outpacing the Sloan now and are um, uh, going to be a fantastic uh, large data set for doing this kind of work. The Vera Rubin Observatory um, will be doing a, a massive time domain survey, looking for things that blink and move in the sky. That starts next year. And that is um, sure to pick up many new quasars that had not previously um, been known. And then of course there are some exciting space missions. The Roman uh, telescope and Euclid are upcoming. Those will be uh, capturing you know, many more deep uh, field surveys of galaxies. And of course, James Webb. So the, the sweetheart of the year, James Webb is, is working. Um, in many ways, it's been referred to as the, the successor to Hubble, but of course it's, um, its specialty is in the infrared. And so this will help us study even more distant galaxies um, and we expect to learn a lot in the coming years. So I'll just leave up this um, summary slide and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. So thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks Rit. Um, so everyone should type questions into the chat if you have them. Um, that's 60 degree angle. Is that, what sets that? Is it the profile of the architecture of the galaxy itself or, in, or the the speed with which the, the outflows? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, so when, so if, if these winds are driven by supernova remnants, what we think is going on is uh, a lot of supernova happen in a kind of dense portion of a galaxy with, or a concentrated area. Um, and as they go off and combine in their effects, of course, that, that explosion goes out isotropically, but the path of least resistance for those explosions is through the disk vertically. And so that's where they kind of pop up. And so they're initially being launched vertically, but spread out um, over time. So they, they carry the rotation of the disk as they go also. Um, and uh, uh, the, yeah, I think the, the spreading out um, occurs naturally. I'm not actually sure if that angle depends on the galaxy mass or the velocity of the gas particularly. Um, that's a really good question. Um, but for most reasonably massive star forming galaxies, um, that angle is the, the prediction. And of course, it may, it may depend on the morphology of the galaxy that's launching the winds as well. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a super precise answer, but um, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's, there's probably a lot of slop to it. And as we get more data, we'll be able to measure that a little bit more precisely. So have, um, here's a question from Robert. Have SpaceX and other satellite constellations 
going, how are they going to affect this work? Or have they yet? Will, are you, how worried are yeah. you about this? <laughs> well, I'm not very optimistic about SpaceX um, and the satellite constellations. I know Amazon has their own and um, the Chinese are launching some too. Uh, it's not really well regulated right now. Um, I do worry about the impact of those constellations on um, the t the, our ability to detect, not quasars necessarily, but near Earth objects, which we should all care about um, in terms of our survival as a species. Um, so I think that the, the LSST crowd who's doing um, this uh, big survey in Chile starting next year, I think they've made, um, I, I, I think they're not um, distraught about the satellite constellations, but it will um, impact the data. So I think it can be corrected for, but it, it will mean that some data are lost. Um, and that just kind of slows down our ability to do good science. So, um, yeah, I'm not a fan of the satellite constellations, though my parents are planning on using it for internet. So, <laughs> I understand the competing interests as well. Um, I think this is from an early slide where you were showing um, the gas in the, in the halo around the galaxy. What is the source of the very fast gas coming in from the outside? Ah, um, yes. Um, so the very fast gas coming in from the, maybe this was the slide. Um, so some of that can come from the halo. If you look at, um, back to uh, the simulation here, I think you can see where that gas is coming from. So some of it's coming from the intergalactic uh, region. So the space between massive galaxies. Um, and some of it uh, gets blown out by outflows from the galaxy as it's forming and then come back in. So it's a mixture of different things. Um, my suspicion is that if, we're, if we start doing a similar kind of study for galaxies at even earlier times, those galaxies are pretty messy. And until they have really nicely formed disks, which um, we think happen maybe around a uh, uh, eight, nine billion years of look back time, um, depending on the mass. Uh, I think that in the absence of a well-formed disk, those, uh, the gas around galaxies is just gonna be really messy. And you might not see really clear inflows coming parallel to the disk and really clear outflows going normal to it. Um, but yeah, that, that gas comes from all over. Some of it is coming back to the galaxy after being blown out. There's definitely a mix. It's um, Here's another one. Are there other ways of detecting this gas? Can we use the spectra from a galaxy itself to look at its gas halo? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's a fantastic question. You can. So there are down the barrel studies as well. So you can look at a galaxy's own light and see gas that is blue shifted towards us. Um, and so that allows you to study the winds looking down into the galaxy itself. Um, and that's a really powerful tool to pair with this backlighting work. So if you have both of those things, you can start to constrain um, how, you know, the geometry of those winds and also their velocities and things. So um, I'm actually working on that right now. We have a new NSF funded program to do that with um, these very large samples of, of galaxy spectra from the Sloan. That's a great, great question. And yes, a very powerful tool. Um, how much HST, JWST, and other instrument time do you get to do this work? Ah, well, as much as I can get. I <laughs> um, it's very competitive. Um, I think the success rates for the Hubble between five and 10% of proposals. Um, and James, James Webb is similar. So um, I put my hat in the ring every time <laughs> and, uh, and cross my fingers, but it, it is challenging. I don't have any James Webb time, but some of my, um, some, some former colleagues of mine uh, have some and will be getting some of the first data, which is really exciting. <laughs> Um, but yeah, next time I'm, I'm always trying. So hopefully. 
So I see you have one of the Sloan plates behind you. Do you want I to do. say something about that? Sure. Um, so let's see. I think I've stopped sharing. Um, so, so this is one of the plates that we use um, to make those measurements. Uh, so I serve on the education and public outreach um, portion of the survey, and we actually have um, a, a program for putting these plates in schools and universities and planetaria. Um, uh, uh, because they can be really great artifacts um, of science to share with the public and students. Um, so this is just one of the plates from the Sloan um, 4 survey, and it has a thousand holes in it. Uh, some of those are dedicated to um, quasar targets. More of them are dedicated to galaxies, and there are a few guide stars um, and, and sky uh, fiber um, places, places as well. So um, these are unique. Uh, every single hole lines up with some object on the sky. And if the observations go well, we tend to only use um, these plates once. So they're kind of unique pieces of the sky. Um, and they can be recycled, but we hope to place many of them in, in educational settings, um, just because it's, it's not that often you can put your hand on something that um, was used for cosmology, for instance. So. Um, yeah, if, any, if anyone who's listening is interested in getting one of these plates, um, you can go to the Education and Public Outreach uh, website for SDSS and request one for your classroom or for your um, astronomy club, and we're always happy to provide them, uh, almost always free of cost. Um, okay, let's see what else do we have. Um, so this one's kind of funny, so I'll, I'll share it. It's a little, little off the beaten path for the questions. My son is a freshman biology major and chem major at UNCA this year, and I, I have been unsuccessful in converting him to astronomy. Where did I fail oh. as a parent, and how can you help? <laughs> Um, oh, well, that's hard. I don't know. I mean, we do have a great on-campus observatory, and I think um, since COVID, we haven't been using it as much as we would like, and um, many students on our campus don't even know that it's there. So I would encourage him to go up and, and check out the observatory at some point. Um, uh, and usually, you know, if, if people are up there using it, you can kind of wander in and maybe uh, take a look through the telescope. But um, yeah, I don't I don't know if I can help with that. <laughs> but I'm happy to hear uh, of a, um, a student in science at UNCA is wonderful. Um, so you were you were at Yale for a while and you do galaxy evolution. Um, is how much of a presence is Beatrice Tinsley still there? Ah, um, yeah, so um, she's a legend. Um, I know, uh, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I have to say I wasn't aware of her before going to Yale, um, but uh, she's legendary. And actually, um, uh, Professor Larson, who's now emeritus, um, collaborated with her. And he was a wonderful um, person in the department who I really enjoyed um, getting to know a little bit. Um, but just a, an enormous depth of knowledge. And I know the two of them um, made really important discoveries. And uh, I, it, you know, I have only heard that she was a lovely person and just a genius. Um, and uh, sadly um, cut off in her prime. But um, yeah, I think more people should know her story. She And her papers are beautiful too. So um, I, I oftentimes quote them in my classes because they're just really uh, beautifully written. So she really sort of revolutionized the field because people were thinking of gal galaxies as static before she sort of shook things up. Yeah, it's my it's my understanding that her work is really fundamental to how we model galaxies and and infer from their spectra things like their stellar mass and their star formation rates. Um, and so, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think it would be hard to overstate her impact <laughs> on the field of galaxy evolution. And it's particularly remarkable given how little time she um, she had in her career. Thanks for asking that. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could speak more about her, but I was only at Yale for three years and um, <laughs> never overlapped with with her, obviously. <laughs> Okay, other questions. There seems to be a, a discussion about Chris's son. People want to let him do biology. Okay. <laughs> or maybe astrobiology, but we, astrobiology. We won't. Yes. We won't uh... <laughs> no, there's there's really great biology research going on at UNCA too. So I don't want to I don't want to be um, stealing anyone. <laughs> Well, thanks. This is really fascinating research. You're probing the depths of the universe by um, by watching that quasar light shine through everything in between. <laughs> so that's really cool. And we look forward to hearing more about your research. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Any other questions? Thank you for the invite. Okay, so that wraps up the presentations, but don't leave because I have to tell you who won the imaging contest. So let me find my email and see if I can extract that information. <clears throat> okay, so the, here are the results. Um, the overall winner and first place winner of the other category is Corianne Delgado with the Milky Way Overbody uh, Lighthouse. So that's our um, overall first place winner and, and for that category. Two-way tied for first place for the deep sky object category. Louis Weinstock for NGC 2024 Flame Nebula and Ron Settle for M8182. Um, and then the next placing behind them is Ron Settle again for M42 Orion Nebula. And then for Solar System Lunar Planetary category, Roger Joyner wins for Copernicus. And second place is Mike Hager with Saturn August 2021. So those are our um, winners. Uh, go back to the website and check them out. We had a lot of really good uh, images there that um, didn't take the prizes. So um, we really appreciate everybody uh, submitting and everybody voting. Um, that's it for TriStar. Um, I, I see a question in the in the chat. Will we share the winning images? Um, maybe we can. Um, well, the link to the to the site is there. I don't know if Paul can designate something on the site to show what who was the winner. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do for that. Um, anyway, thanks everybody for, um, for coming out today. We had four really great talks. Um, and we appreciate um, all our speakers contributing. So um, big round of applause for all of them. Um, another year of really good talks. We will plan on making the recordings available um, at our website a little bit later. We're, what we're going to have to do is extract them out of here and then um, um, get them ready to repost. And so it may be a few uh, days before that shows up. But if you know anyone who missed it, I know a number of our students are on spring break now and they'll want to see it when they get back. Um, we will have those available. And if you have questions, you can email me. I'm, I'm listed at the TriStar website as a contact. So um, let me leave it at that and let people go on to enjoy the rest of their day. Um, next year, if it's the first Saturday in March, it's going to be TriStar. So um, if you have ideas for good speakers, let me know. And um, uh, you know we'll plan to have the next edition, hopefully in person, so we can all hang out together like we used to. Thanks for coming out.